Perfect, sir. So now you can close it, sir. Yeah, yeah. We can start exactly by three o'clock, sir. It is hanging here. Okay, okay, sir. Maybe some network issue. Time is there, sir? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Just check. The video is playing. Yes, sir. Playing, sir. Okay. Fine. Fine. Thanks for your time, sir. Yes, no issues. Should I stop sharing? Yes, sir. You can stop sharing, sir. We are going to share you the intro slides by three o'clock. We start. Okay. Dr. Tamara, is the voice clear? Yes, sir. Perfect, sir. Very clear, sir. Okay. 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 So we will start by three o'clock, sir. Sure. Yes, yes, yes. Exact three. We will start. Okay. So one sir has joined. Yes, sir. Sir has joined already. Okay, okay, okay. Yes.
It's a very wonderful good afternoon to you all. So we welcome you on behalf of the CRC Davangere Combo Site Design Center for skill development, rehabilitation, and the empowerment of the persons with disabilities under the administrative control of NIPID, National Institute for the Empowerment of Persons with Intellectual Disabilities, Second Rampart. So uh, once again, uh, this wonderful afternoon. So we are going to conduct. Uh, most awaited webinar for this year and uh, on the topic see uh, optimizing hand function sprinting to optimize the hand function in children with cerebral palsy and it is a one hour webinar and to deliver the lecture and we have the one of the eminent speakers in the field of occupational therapy especially in the hand rehabilitation dr shovan saga sir uh, sorry, uh, Associate Professor from the Manipal Institute. And uh, we have our director also, Dr. Uma Sangar Mondisar, also has joined in our program. So, on behalf of you, and I welcome you all the participants. And as you know, the hand function is important. And, and uh, already we have uh, more than 1,200 registrations so far for this program. That shows the uh, huge success of this program. And actually, we uh, we stopped the registrations two days back itself because of the uh, more number of participants. And we are planning this program in YouTube Live also. Those who are not able to join can join, watch this program through YouTube Live also. So due to the uh, overwhelming responses that we received for this program. So thank you, thank you once again for all the participants for your continuous support to conduct this program. So I would like to thank uh, Dr. Umar Sangar Mohanty, sir, our director, CRC Dawan Gray, for his continuous support and guidance. And uh, Sarumli shared the sir's number so that we would be able to contact sir and uh, 
uh, we are just going to utilize the resource of these uh, Dr. Sohan Saga, sir. And also, I would like to thank uh, Sri B.V. Ramkumar, sir, uh, the director of the NIPIT National Institute for the uh, Empowerment of the Persons with Intellectual Disabilities for his uh, support and guidance uh, throughout uh, our uh, means this, uh, service. So, without taking much time, so now I would like to request our director, uh, CRC Dr. Masangar Mahadi, sir, to deliver the keynote address about this program. Sir, over to you. Namaskar. Uh, good afternoon to all the participants. As uh, coordinator Dr. Tambarai just mentioned, we got one overwhelming response. Nearly 1,200 uh, uh, people are uh, keen to attend this program. So I am uh, indeed delighted to have this webinar from our CRC Davangere on the topic splinting to optimize hand function in children with uh, cerebral palsy. Uh, as per the recent uh, studies and uh, meta-analysis, near to 60% of uh, uh, CP uh, children, uh, they have uh, difficulty in the hand skill. And as we all are aware, that uh, international classification for functioning model, it has uh, rather than focusing on body function and structure, it is now giving more emphasis on activity and participation. So uh, splinting plays a, definitely a quite a major role in the children with a cerebral palsy. And uh, I am glad and delighted to have uh, Dr. Sogan Saha. He is uh, one of the renowned authority uh, in the field of splinting because uh, I know him personally from uh, uh, last 24 years. And uh, we had, I had the opportunity to interact with him while I was uh, working as a faculty at uh, uh, KMC, uh, under KMC uh, Manipal at Mangalore. And then I did my post graduation in Manipal. We had a very nice uh, personal and professional interaction. So thank you, Sobhan Saha, sir, for uh, agreeing to uh, do one webinar with us uh, at the CRC uh, Davangare. And uh, we are keen to hear from you. And I'm uh, extending one hearty welcome to all the all the participants. Uh, they are going to definitely, uh, there will be a lot of take home messages for, for them. They can apply it in the respective profession uh, aspects or you know, it will be quite educative for them. I sincerely thank uh, the support uh, of uh, patron, Sri Bibi Ramkumar sir, uh, for, uh, for this uh, webinar and his constant support. He is the direct, uh, officiating director of uh, our parent uh, administrative control office, that is from Lipid Sikandarabad. And uh, uh, hearty appreciation for the coordinator, Dr. Tamarai Selvan, who has been uh, taking a lot of interest, uh, taking a lot of responsibilities uh, from our uh, uh, CRC Davangare. We appreciate Dr. Tamarai for your efforts. And once again, I thank uh, Dr. Sohan Sa, sir, and we are all keen to uh, listen to you. And uh, thanks to all the uh, participation. And keep joining us in all our future programs. Thank you. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohanty, sir, for your wonderful keynote address. And uh, let me introduce about the uh, the SAR doesn't need any introduction uh, among the uh, rehabilitation professors, especially among the PTs and OTs, because the SAR is uh, well known. They are one of the, as our directors are told, so renowned uh, clinician and the academician in the field of occupational therapy. And uh, SAR is an uh, associate professor uh, in the Department of Occupational Therapy at Manipal Institute. And SAR has completed his MOT in uh, hand rehabilitation and has has done his uh, PhD in assistive technology. Okay, assistive technology PhD. And Sarah's interesting area is the hand rehab, uh, splinting, and uh, low technology devices. And uh, Sarah has many awards in his name. And to name a few, Sarah has received a Madoc International Award at AOTA. And Sarah has received the Best Teacher Award in Manipal Institute. And uh, Sarah has several patents filed in his name and uh, sorry is sorry so uh, one important thing is sorry has been invited uh, during 23rd and 22nd 23rd uh, global summit meet uh, conducted at who geneva to represent india uh, on the topic uh, of assistive technology sorry has represented our india 
and during the August 2099 Global Summit conducted by the WHO in Geneva. And Sir is currently the president of the Indian Society of Hand Therapy. So, so it, it continues. So, I would like to stop here. Otherwise, uh, due to short of time, and I request Dr. Shavan Saga, sir, to start his presentation. Sir, now screen is yours. You can take over, sir. Yeah, thank you. So, as I share my screen. Yes, sir. You can share. Am I heard clearly? Yes, yes, sir. 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 Yeah, is my screen seen? Yes, sir, yes, sir. It's coming. Sir. Coming. Okay. So, okay, small so as the... yes, sir, yes, sir. Huh. Sorry to bother, sir. One small request to all the participants, sir. Uh, please do not share your screen in between, and uh, that may disturb the sessions. And uh, please uh, keep your mic in mute and audio, both the audio and video in mute, so that there won't be any disturbances during the session. Okay. It's so, a kind request from the organizers to the all the participants. Yes, sir. You can carry on. Sir. Yeah. Okay, uh, a very good afternoon to all of you uh, at the outset. So your slides are not visible, sir. You just open your PowerPoint, sir. Yeah. Yes. Visible, right? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Okay. okay, so very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, my heartfelt thanks to uh, Director CRC Davangiri, a good friend of mine, Dr. Uma Shankar Mohanty. Uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Selvan for uh, you know uh, being in touch and coordinating this entire thing, and of course thanks to the entire team of uh, CRC, the admin of CRC for having me here, and my dear participants. So uh, as you can see, the today's topic is on uh, how to optimize hand function. Okay, so. As has been mentioned in the keynote, uh, uh, you know, speech by Dr. Mohanty, the significance and importance of function because it is the hand through which we explore the environment. Okay, and uh, so there are many ways to optimize the hand function. There are different ways of therapy. So splinting happens to be one of them. You know, I I practice that. And through this presentation, it is mainly uh, trying to share my experiences, uh, what we do here in at our facility. And uh, probably through this presentation, followed by the discussion, we'll have take home message to look at the problem, the problem of hand function uh, in a, through a different prism, you know, having a different perspective. Uh, because hand function, there is no, you know, thumbs rule into this. There is no straight cut method. Okay, we all know working in the field of uh, rehab that it does involve a lot of trial and error. Okay, the whole process is uh, at times predictable, at times unpredictable. So we should be ready to try out different options, you know, different possible options. Okay, so here I am presenting to you one of the options that we have in our hand. Before I move forward, uh, you know, what brings me into this subject of technology and hand function? Okay, so me as an occupational therapist by profession, uh, are you all able to see my cursor moving on the screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, yes, sir. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so this is this is a this is a, a health tunnel 
I mean, this is how I perceive. This is a health, health tunnel, and at the entry of this tunnel, you have uh, most of the time it is a physician who is there, and the patient walks into this tunnel, and based on uh, the need of the individual, there are a host of professionals who engage with this uh, patient, okay, and trying to uh, bring changes. At the mouth or at the exit point of this, uh, it is uh, uh, an occupational therapist who is there because from this mouth, the patient is likely to take a giant leap, okay, once again into the realm of the society. The society where uh, we are all defined by what we do, how we do, okay, so it is defined based on our productivity, the functional productivity. So when a person with limitation, you know, is exiting this tunnel, okay, it is very important that there has been sufficient uh, work been done to refine the output, okay, so that the individual is able to match up to the need of the society, you know, the the output, the correctness, uh, the uh, accuracy, the speed with which an individual will perform, okay. So when we have to do, do this matching over, that is when we need some technical solution. There is a lot of scope of technical uh, or technological solution at that point. So that that brings my interest into the picture. Uh, my area of ex uh, essentially is in traumatic hand, okay? Uh, uh, but of late last almost a half a decade, I have been taking uh, interest in neurological hand as well. So that is how uh, I am into this topic. Uh, as I will try to, I, I would want to draw your attention to this small little yellow box at the bottom of this slide. Uh, there is a difference between movement and meaningful action. So uh, this is another important aspect that we need to understand. Uh, movement and meaningful action are uh, related, but they are not interchangeable phenomena. Okay, they are quite distinct. Okay, uh, movement is in bits and pieces of meaningful action. Okay, so supposing let us take example of eating. Okay, we all know that for eating we need a little bit of internal rotation of the shoulder, little bit of flexion of the shoulder. Okay, little bit of abduction of the shoulder as well, flexion of the elbow you know, pronation, supination of the forearm, cascading movement of the fingers. So if you look at them, they are, we can identify them as different, different movements. But when eating has to happen, this all movement has to synchronize in a particular pattern. Okay, that pattern is often coded for that individual because all of us have a slightly different way of eating. Okay, so, uh, uh, these movements, they, they synchronize to form a unique code for that individual. Okay, because when we look at splinting, we need to understand splinting from the perspective of all these things. Okay, it is splint, uh, as we practice, it is, it is not a condition, this is the condition, so you give this splint. Okay. It is we, we create the designs, we create the splints and we have to connect it to the specific need of the individual. Of course, this example in front of you is not a cerebral palsy, this thing, but I want to, through this presentation, I would want to drive a message. As is written, making a splint is no big deal, but making a change in the mind and body with a splint is a real challenge and is it a big deal. Okay, so it is not that it is a piece of metal or a piece of plastic that you are making and handing it over to the patient. Okay, it is about how the device is getting connected with the individual's aspirations. Okay, so if you see here, you know, I hope the video is playing for the audience. Yes, sir, yes, sir, it's yeah. playing. Yes, yes, great. Okay, so this is the video of a hand who herself is a doctor. She's an anatomist by profession. And this is her hand following a traumatic uh, incident. Okay, and this is her right hand. So when she came to us, she's an anatomist. So she knows in and out what has happened inside her body. 
which part is affected which muscle which bone you know she is absolute thorough with that so when she came to us she was very clear first we had to you know kind of give her an orientation that uh, you know, what is occupational therapy who we, we are and uh, what is it that we can offer the individual so the you know she was smart enough to pick it up and then she said that you know as i understand from your discussion okay i would want i am a teacher i am a teacher of anatomy so i need three things i should be able to open my car door and my office cabin door i should be able to do cadaveric dissections and i should be able to write on the blackboard so these three things right so the you know the goal was set the goal was set the individual presented the goal to us okay now if you see there are host of these devices the beauty of these devices is it is for that one one hand only okay it is for that lady so these devices were made uh, and she was with us for almost one and a half year okay and these devices were all made step by step over a period of one and a half year so when we choose a splint remember that we have to commit it to the patient that look this is the splint we are making this is the cost of that and this is how it will respond this will be the outcome you can expect and then that splint will do the work and then you start negotiating for the second splint then third splint fourth splint fifth splint so right now in front of you in the image there are 22 devices for the same hand same patient over a period of one and a half year okay to come to this you can see it is encircled okay so the hand was prepared the hand was prepared in a particular direction because she had outlined it at right at the beginning okay anybody can guess what is it circled anybody in the audience what is this possible could be so this is an adapted chalk holder someone has written as a pen sir pen in chat box ha no it is a adapted chalk holder because she has to write on the blackboard okay so this adapted chalk holder to reach to this point you know to reach to this point we had to go through this entire process 21 different devices to reach to this point okay now let us again come back to this making a splint is no big deal but making a change in the mind and body with a splint is a real challenge and is a big deal this is the hand of a quadriplegic cerebral palsy okay and uh, this is his hand this is how his hand was when he came to us he had a dream his parents had a dream can my son do bca bachelor's in computer application okay when he came to us he was old okay he was around 22 year old and he wanted to type typing was very difficult for him because this was whenever he was making an attempt you can see a little sample here whenever he is making an attempt okay it goes into extreme flexion and then the wrist will start hurting okay it will start hurting and then he loses interest right and then this is what was given to him you can see the splint is a haggard splint torn out you know from a common man's point of view you will find that the splint is you know what is big deal about this splint right but this is what he said i had to wait for 24 long years to get a splint remember that his cupboard is filled with splints his cupboard is filled with splints and but nothing seems to be working okay he is not happy okay he is not happy so how do we come up with a design which will make the person happy right and when he when he first got this splint this visual is little old so 
you can see it is and the interesting thing is he 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 doesn't want to change the splint because he is thinking that if any change the whole alignment which is giving him so much of comfort and functionality it might go away so he doesn't let off that splint they are well off family it is not that they don't have money they are well off family and when he started typing comfortably this is the social media post that he created and posted a thanksgiving to me to the uh, treating therapist on the facebook Okay, you see this image again. Another quadriplegic. When he came to us, he was around 14 year old, and his request was, "How do I eat myself? Okay, on my own, how do I eat? Okay, many of you in the audience, I am sure, will be treating cerebral palsy kids, and here, if you see this, you know, the distance, the distance between the hand and the mouth might be hardly four inch to five inch." but we do not know when this hand will reach the mouth it will take one week two week one month will it ever reach the mouth okay whether will he be able to independently eat okay when i say independent uh, my uh, you know sense of independence is modified independence so please do not compare your independence with their independence okay so the scientific world is divided whether it works or it doesn't but as long as it is not proved that it is harmful and a viable alternative is available we would want to believe that it works and will continue to render this as an option why i am making this statement because as we all know you know attending this presentation uh, it, it is not a new fact that uh, you know splinting in neurological condition is a debatable intervention okay there is a school of thought that thinks that okay it doesn't work okay there is an another you know um, school of thought that says it works okay so me working in this area i would want to believe that whether it works or not but we see that patient is gaining certain amount of independence so when this boy posed this question that you know i have this problem and i want to eat there were a group of post graduates who were there with me and i i i you know uh, posed the same question to those group of students you know what do you think the child is asking now when we will be able to make him independent in eating you know everybody is quite confused that when why how sir can ask that when okay so uh, finally nobody could give an answer you know i mean uh, to give a deadline for a patient who whether they when they will eat it's something different is unheard of we usually don't discuss okay in the next 45 minutes okay so this is these two pictures are at the gap of 45 minutes okay it was at the gap of 45 minutes okay so this is the power of these interventions okay now uh, uh, how 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 can we refute this now this image these possibilities yes it may not work for everybody there there will be certain clients who might be well suited for these interventions and some may not but giving a blanket you know uh, disapproval okay it probably will compromise some of the people who could be a possible candidate for a better outcome through these solutions okay so now some of the literatures if you run through some of the literature this is one of the most uh, you know followed uh, cited these things and they clearly mention that there is a very moderate quality evidence available that it works okay now i i will come to that point a little later uh, trying to you know present my point of view as well now this is another way of looking at the same problem a tack a tacked focus of current neurological rehabilitation strategies is maximizing plasticity within the central nervous system okay so 
you know any kind of neurological intervention we it is an established fact that there are neuronal plasticity that happens okay without doubt so yes and they are rightly so however what can often be forgotten is that the musculoskeletal system is just as plastic and deterioration in the form of muscle wastage adaptive changes in the length and stiffness okay or contracture and fixed flexion deformities so what they are saying is that although we are quite uh, you know understandable about the neuronal plasticity they are emphasizing here that there there is remember that there is musculoskeletal changes happening okay and so we should be mindful of that so we need to come up with uh, strategies where we are you know targeting that that part as well so the current evidence is unequivocal in demonstrating that the current practice is not effective in preventing these musculoskeletal com uh, com uh, complications so they are very candid in mentioning that we are only targeting the neuronal plasticity okay but what about you know the 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 changes the plastic changes or the plastic deterioration happening for the musculoskeletal condition uh, in neurological condition while focusing neurological rehabilitation on facilitating neural neuronal uh, recovery and preventing spasticity is important it is equally essential that steps are taken to prevent and if needed treat the detrimental changes associated with this maladaptive musculoskeletal plasticity uh yeah so this is one observation that this study had made hand splints were not well tolerated in this population now here i would want to you know expand it a little more now what happens is in the in the field this has been my observation over uh, working in this field in the field of splinting for the last two decades and uh, taking interest in the you know in neurological conditions over the last more than uh, you know half a decade more than 6 7 years last okay so what happens is uh, often when when the splints have been prescribed okay it is uh, it can be an occupational therapist it can be a physical therapist who is prescribing splints it can be a doctor as well now these three category of professionals often what happens is they are uh you know handling this patient they are understanding the spasticity the contracture but they are handling this phenomena from the point of view of therapy okay they are not viewing it from the point of view of splint okay so th th there is an issue right and then they are referring it to the many a times it is an orthotic and prosthetic engineers now they do not have a hang of this spasticity and contracture okay they are making it as and when they are getting the prescription right so there is now there is a problem there is a communication gap because as we all know that spasticity is a dynamic phenomena and it makes it even more complicated when there is a layer of contracture under the belly of spasticity okay it makes it very very complicated right and as you all know that spasticity is connected with the in, in, in uh, person's emotional status okay so when you know it can happen that when the patient is you know in your hand patient is comfortable so the spasticity on the is on the lower side and you are picking up the range of joints the stretchability of the spasticity based on that okay but when but when the splint is made or any device is made and when it is put now it is a foreign substance that is getting into the individual's body part the tissues immediately rebel okay the tissues will immediately rebel and the spasticity will shoot up now what we will do is you are going to force the splint okay there comes a little bit of conflict either we as therapist we tell the parents no no you are not putting it properly 
or we we probably you know blame it on the child that the child is non compliant okay and we fail to understand that there are some very critical missing links that are missed in this in this whole bargain okay and then finally everybody concludes that the splint is okay but patient is non compliant so we as professionals we are quick to take a very defensive position you know we we are quick to take a a, a very safe position as far as we professionals are concerned so as a result of that what is happening is there is device rejection is a huge problem it is a huge problem okay but we as professionals we get away by telling that you know parents are not cooperating the child is not cooperating okay so that is that is the key factor that is why that boy said it has taken me 24 years okay so if you see those angles those angles are all decided okay those angles are all decided they are not standard nothing is standard so i, I wanted to convey that to this okay so this is a standard definition externally applied devices used to modify uh, the structural and functional characteristics of the neuromuscular and skeletal systems by applying the forces to the body so you have uh, there are some text matters i will try to rush through them non functional hand splints uh, you have functional hand splints so there are these in the literature there are these categories that are been made so uh, when we are working into this we need to identify whether there is a need for a non functional splint whether there is a need for functional splint okay those you know those understanding has to be there okay yeah may, can i request the audience to please mute yourself i think so i'm getting some voices yeah thank you is yes, a mute is a mute yeah 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 okay okay so using splints adjunct to goal directed activity now uh, this is what uh, is our thrust area so whenever we are looking at a splint okay uh, it has a remedial part and it has a functional part okay and to a small extent a compensatory part so these terminologies uh, unfortunately we don't have much time to you know dwell into these uh, things but these are very very deep concepts that we make use of okay to be able to come up with a a, a logical conclusion that you know what is it that we are going to offer to the individual so upper limb hand splints in conjunction with goal directed training okay so many of the splints which i will show you later on okay many of these splints gone to become part of therapy okay uh, there are splints which the patient need not use all the time okay so it will be in a very uh, rationed way where for therapy use it and take it off for therapy use it we take it off so there is one variety of splints a uh, carry over effect of splinting plus therapy so it is very important splint alone will not do the work okay it is always a supporting thing and also as i mentioned carry over effect of therapy okay the splint will try to hold on to that otherwise if you see i am sure all of you would have faced this challenge you know during therapy session you achieve something next day when the patient is coming back to you you are back to square one okay so splint does help to retain whatever we have achieved through therapy okay so that is another positive aspect uh, and yes uh, dr mohanty did mention about the icf thing yes uh, it has given lot of uh, it has empowered us you know I, icf in fact as we all know that as compared to you know icif dh icf really empowers all of us as professionals rehab professionals okay and it empowers lot of our intervention and through this model everything should gear towards one ultimate thing that is participation okay the the final outcome you know of of whatever uh, therapy we are offering 
the ultimate outcome is defined decided by uh, uh, you know how effective the individual is in participating in in, in the society okay a quick run couple of sentences on pathophysiology of spasticity in in connection with splint okay so uh, pathophysiology of spasticity is a big thing but these are some of the key points which uh, uh, which is of interest when we are uh, you know dwelling with the subject of splinting chronic spasticity shortens muscles and it does alter the elastic properties so it is not a purely neurological aspect as we have written, uh, uh, you know saw it in the previous slide also there are certain mechanical alteration happening in the tissues you know along with the uh, neurological aspect so splint predominantly plays a part in you know trying to undo the mechanical uh, changes that is happening in the tissues factors other than reflex hyper excitability may produce an increase in the resistance okay so what they are saying is uh, it is not it is not completely true you know that you know spasticity is increasing okay as we all know that uh, the insult to the brain you know the hypoxic damage to the brain during the birth or immediately after birth that is, is something constant okay so the spasticity emerging out of that also is uh, um, quite well defined okay in spite of that we might see that there is an increase in the spasticity okay so when we see increase in the spasticity it it might be not truly spasticity it might be a mix of spasticity and contracture which on testing we might because you know the spasticity one of the ways to fi figure it out is the, the feel of stretch you know the resistance the resistance to stretch is one of the indicators of how much spasticity uh, uh, is there so what can happen is as i mentioned earlier the underbelly in the underbelly of the spasticity there might be contracture and contracture is increasing so it can happen spasticity is more or less the same but the contracture is increasing and that is why the resistance to stretch also is increasing okay so that is uh, that is uh, that has been established significant structural adaptations does happen in the soft tissue okay so and uh, as high as 30 to 40% of the cases in in cerebral palsy as high as 30 to 40% of the cases there will be obvious contracture along with the spasticity okay and remember that if a patient is not presenting with contracture only spasticity patient is likely to head towards contracture so that we need to uh, uh, be able to anticipate as professionals okay so that uh, it should not give us a surprise you know you uh, uh, you are following up a patient after 6 months and then uh, um, you know you had not given the patient any hint and the, because you told to you know uh, follow up after 6 months the patient is coming after 6 months and suddenly you realize that the uh, the resistance to stretch has dramatically increased okay so that means from a stretchable contracture it has it is now gradually becoming non stretchable contracture so we should be able to anticipate we should be able to educate the uh, uh, the family members accordingly uh, educate them uh you know the kind of precautions that they need to take the kind of vigil that they need to uh, uh you know keep um, on the child and need to get back to the therapist so biological rationale of splinting spasticity uh you have therapeutic stre uh, stretching should thus be very gradual so as we all know that in uh, you know when you stretch spasticity spasticity is none other than uh, you know hyper excited stretch reflex okay so uh, it is very important that the stretch has to be given very very gradual okay when we are giving splint you know as we are going to see whenever we are giving splint in spastic conditions 
it is always given at a suboptimal range okay so for that 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 is where this knowledge comes into play what is the comfortable stretch for a spastic muscle from which range the discomfort starts what is the tolerable discomfort what is the non tolerable discomfort all these variations needs to be captured and this is this is the perspective when we look at the spasticity from the viewpoint of splinting okay because this stretch will be there on the patient's uh, tissues for 6 hours to 8 hours okay now this viewpoint is very different from the viewpoint of stretching the spastic muscles during therapy during therapy you are doing manually and it will last a stretch can last for hardly 4 minutes 5 minutes okay so the tissue response for a 4 minutes 5 minute stretch and the tissue response for 8 hour stretch is obviously very very different that is why the understanding also has to be very different when the muscle is stretched gradually the additional sarcomeres will make the muscles less sensitive to stretch stretching should always be done within the child's submaximal range now this to estimate the submaximal range is very uh, important uh, stretch uh, was most effective when it is applied continuously for time periods greater than 6 hours and we need to be able to break and splint does it okay it breaks the spasticity contracture spasticity loop okay so these are the various rationals how it works uh, uh, splinting and spasticity okay so we are going to quickly run through you know how we deal with these things so you can see there is a hand this is a uh, Okay, uh, I hope the video is playing. I just want to be sure. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's playing. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is a hand. This is the hand of an infantile hemi. Okay, uh, when he came here, probably around 18, 20 years old, right? And you can see, you know, it's, it's getting demonstrated how, uh, you know, the spasticity in the contracture is. And this is a very usual presentation. So this is a cock up splint given and this is to stretch the, uh, you know, the, um, the flexion, con uh, the elbow flexion contractures. How do we stretch? How much we stretch? You know, what is the permissible? So the design should support. Okay, you can see this is a cock up splint. You will not see this cock up splint. This is not a usual presentation of a cock up splint. Okay, but this is what the patient needs. Okay, so we can't just stretch it just because you are able to stretch at that point. So you need to take into account how the tissues will respond after six years, uh, sorry, six hours of continuous stretch. Okay, so this is the stretching the elbow flexors which have undergo contracture and this is stretching the long flexors. Okay. So this is how it starts with, and then we gradually go on stretching and slowly it will get into extended position. This is another presentation, thumb in palm, you know, I think so all of you who are dealing with children, thumb in palm, of course, is an adult problem as well. Okay. But especially when the child is learning various motor activities, and you find that the thumb is occupying the space inside the palm, then the palm is left with no other space for objects to get into the palm. Okay. So, so this is, this is the hand. Okay. This is how we pull it out. Okay. And remember that all these splints, they undergo several revisions. Okay. And you can see, okay, a thumb in palm. Okay, this is a hand. This almost is around uh, just over a month period. Okay.
Okay, so you can see the thumb is reasonably open to a point where he can start using the thumb. Okay. This is how we try to see that how, you know, what would be the wrist extension angle that we are going to decide for this patient where we can get optimum finger function. Less than that, you will be underperforming for the patient. More than that, there will be a sudden reduction in the finger opening. Okay. So to make that judgment, you know, is of critical importance. So trying to catch them young, you know, so uh, it is very important. The earlier we catch them, the earlier we intervene, you know, we are creating that much of opportunity for this young child, making their future, you know, reasonably better. Okay, so you can see here, this is around a 10 year old child. Okay. A very small splint. Making pediatric splint is a huge challenge. Okay, so everything has to be going. So you can see here, we just made a palm splint. See, if you see it carefully, okay, it is a palm splint. We never stretch completely. So when we are making splint, especially in neurological condition, it is called as phase of acclimatization. Okay, it can happen, especially for children, such young children. Okay, uh, what we do is we are not, because for the child, we need to understand that for the child, the splint is a foreign thing going, entering into the hand. Okay, we, we are not expecting the splint to start working right from day one. We, we, we would want that the child to get used to the splint. So many a times, you know, when we know that the child is not tolerating the splint, we just let the splint just be there on the hand. It will not do anything. It is just hanging on the hand. That's all. So that is the phase of acclimatization. The child emotionally gets used to a, a, a foreign thing handing, uh, you know, hanging on the hand. Once the child, the parent can come back to us after a week, then they'll say that, oh, now, now the child is pretty happy with the splint hanging on the hand. Then now what will you do? We'll put the splint on the palm now. Now the, it will we'll start positioning it at the right point, what we intend to do. Okay, so then, then we'll put it. We'll not stretch, but it will just keep it in position. Again, after one week, they will come back. Yes, now the child is comfortable. Now we'll stretch. So if you see this, in the background actually, the child is crying a little, but it is much less. It is much less because the child used to scream. Okay. So we have given palm based. Then later on, we'll now make it forearm based. So these, you know, juggling with the position is the key. Okay. So you can see here, a monoplegic. So what task we have given is to place the cap over the bottle and, you know, just position the hand on top of the bottle. So this is the task given. For this activity, we have given this splint for therapy purposes. Now you can see how the entire limb gets stabilized. So we need to figure it out that what is it? So if you see here, you see both the videos playing for you. Okay. And just observe the hand. Okay. With the splint, the hand is for such a long time on top of that bottle. Right. So splint offers great amount of stability, but for that, we should be able to 
figure out these different permutations and combinations. So you can see here the different splints. Okay. So you can have a hand which is so plastic. Okay, and you can see a cocker splint given like this. Then someday it will come like this. So it's a very big journey from, you know, a completely extended wrist, finger, thumb abduction to a hand where, you know, everything is flexed. This is a long journey from here to here. And there are several steps of splinting that happens in between. Splints in NICU, okay, that is, you know, trying to catch them even younger. Although this presentation is for upper extremity, I have few slides for the lower extremity as well. Okay, so this is a, a, a brachial plexus. You know, birth brachial plexus injury, this is subclavian artery uh, um, stenosis and multiple congenital contractures. So this is, this is another example of how we activate joint movements. So if you see both this hand, this is an adult lady, okay. So you can see here, when we ask the patient to flex and make a fist, this is what we get. So we block this and you will be surprised after so many years, her MCP is moving. Okay, otherwise every time she makes an attempt, this is what she gets. Okay. So this is how we try to activate a joint which otherwise will not move. And what happens is she's developed, a, you know, non-stretchable contracture of the MCP joint. So when she went to the surgeon, they said you have to do arthrolysis. Okay, which was not very at that stage. Okay, so this, this was one of the method that we started. This is again, you know, a small child with infantile hemi. So this child had come down to us from Hyderabad, all the way from Hyderabad. Okay. So whenever the child is making any effortful task on the sound side, this is what happens to the affected side. And this was a concern by the parents. Okay. This is a concern by the parents. So this is what was happening, right? Then this is how we blocked it. This is how we blocked it, okay? So the child is given increasingly effortful task on the unaffected side, and we are break, trying to break the pattern, okay? We are trying to break the pattern. So we tried out in the department, they tried out at their home, okay? And this is what we see after day two. Okay? You can see the child now can make an attempt to even extend the elbow. So if you see here, once the it will go into flexion, he on his own cannot bring it to extension. See, but here you can see that it is day two, okay? After one year, Okay, so after one year, you see this. Okay, he can attempt, he can coordinate it, and he can do without anything. Okay, this is a very interesting case because once a year, the parents, the father, mother, child, they fly down from Hyderabad to Manipal. Okay, and this is the entire set of splint given to them. Every year they will come, they will bring the entire set 
make any changes or if you have to be changed completely we'll do it okay so the seven devices at different joints they use it and they come all the way from hyderabad to manipal for this seven devices okay so so you can imagine that what see we we are nobody to say whether it is powerful or not it is a user who is identifying it that way and that is when we are also saying it this is an infantile hemi we make some adaptive devices as well more than uh, along with the splint this is an infantile hemi and her left side is involved she wants to drink water with the affected hand especially when she is eating with the unaffected side because her hand would be smeared with you know rice gravy all those things so that is the time when she wants to drink water okay and uh, there is no way that she can do it and uh, you can see her grip so it is an absolutely uh, we can't make use of that so this is the adaptation given you will be surprised she was sipping water for the first time with the affected hand after 17 years 17 okay so that is this thing so if you look at this device it is very ordinary very simple but when the patient needed it the most are we able to deliver it okay are we able to deliver it the child the mother the father the daughter in this case they all started crying okay so it is not the look of the device or we can't say whether it is simple or not we need to appreciate it in the context it is it, it is been used you know the entire background okay so it can't be simple if everybody there was such an emotional expression once the child is able to do this activity that she has been wanting okay and when she sipped the first sip of water you know, sorry sir, sorry to interrupt you sir and, uh, actually one uh, participant is by mistake he shared the screen and could you share the screen once again sir uh okay what do i do share do it I... again sir okay share it okay Participants, please note: uh, do not share your screen in between. See, uh, that's why these kind of disturbances are happening. Kindly, kindly avoid sharing your screen. It's showing now, sir. It is visible. Yes, sir. Yes, I am showing. Yes. Carry on. So it, carry is on. it this particular slide that got this things, or even previous slide? Yes, sir. That the glass holder, sir. Glass holder. Ah, okay, okay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, so that that's the story. So it is always in the context. Okay. It is always in the context that we uh, visualize these devices and. whether we are able to dish it out at the time when they need the most okay or are we do we end up saying that okay you uh, you come next time we'll try to do something then it doesn't work like that this is another case a case of infantile hemi as you can see there is a obvious limb length discrepancy okay and uh, this girl wanted to help her mother in kitchen work okay so we need to map it out that what kind of work that she is looking at what is the problem that she has so she told that she has difficulty in handling hot utensils 
on and off the oven. Okay, and she wants to this thing. So we need to map it out. We need to figure it out that how big is the family? What are the kind of utensils? You know, when I say how big is the family means that shows that what will be the weight of the, you know, cooking that has happened because she has to lift those things. Okay, so uh, the problem with her was she cannot, she has no control over the opening and closing of the hand. Okay, she has no control over it. So it can be very dangerous if she's handling hot utensils, okay, on and off the oven. Okay, now the question is, why do we have to do it then? Okay, we can always tell that you please avoid it, right? But it is their wish, okay? And we have to make sure that how can we make the process safe and foolproof, right? So you can see here, this video will help you understand, you know, so, so you can see here, uh, to address that problem, uh, we came up with this device, okay, and uh, and we then trained her at the elbow and at the shoulder because it already had certain amount of voluntary control, so it was e easy for us to train them. But for you know getting the opening and closing of the hand under control was a challenge. So uh, uh, and for us time was running out. So the patient. Uh, we, we are at Manipal and the patient is from Mysore. Okay, so which is around close to 400 kilometers from uh, Manipal. Okay, and uh, so if the patient cannot wait indefinitely. You know, we need to give an answer quickly within a few days time. And th that also is a defined time period. Okay, so all these intervention that I'm trying to show you, remember that everything is time bound. Okay, everything is time bound. Okay, so you can see here the device is getting ready. So you can see that handle. So you don't really need to catch hold of things. So you are basically going to hang it across the palm. So here it is. Okay, so irrespective of the hand open or close, it will latch onto your hand. So we found out that one of the utensils that they use is a kadai. Okay, we, we say kadai, I don't know, others might, you might have a different way to describe it, and this is saucepan, we call it. So these are the identified as two different vessels. Okay, the other hand is perfectly normal. Okay, but these two hands, uh, uh, these devices, uh, these utensils, as we all know, I'm sure most of you have used it, we do need two hands. Okay, so this is a writing device, again, another CP child. So you can see here, when he normally makes an attempt, he can hardly create any impression on the page. So if you can see both the writings, the one with the device is much darker. Okay, the lines are longer and it is darker and he has better control over the pen. Okay, this is another kid. Okay, so you can see here, the obvious this thing, the lines are much bigger and bolder. Okay, as compared to this thing. So these splints are not to be used continuously. We give it for, and that is when the child starts this thing, because when the child is, so the splint is getting merged with the child's activity. So all those designs are kept that, uh, I mean, when we are designing it, we are keeping that in mind. Okay, that my child with this device is it has to facilitate writing on the blackboard. Okay, that has to be there in mind. So all the cuts in that that you give, all the angles, all the bends, the contours, they all support uh, uh, that uh, goal. Now quickly, just a few slides on the lower extremity. When we talk about cerebral palsy, uh, a tight TA is a matter of concern. Okay, so here you can see bilateral tight TA. So making splints for such small children and which fits and uh, which is compliant, remember that all these angles are not done in one shot. Okay, 
So my splint should have those provisions where I can keep alter it, altering it, because the design cannot be, you know, that okay every two weeks I'll give the patient a new splint. It will not happen like that. Okay, it will be the same design. So the design, I mean, same splint. So it has to be. Uh, we need to keep enough provision where we make these changes. So that was a plastic for a small kid. This is a metal one. So stretching the tear. Remember that they will. They are not going to walk with this. It is splint, which most of the time it is prescribed when they are lying down, especially as night splints. So, you know, these sometimes simple interventions can uh, work. You can see how the girl is wobbling, diplegic. With uh, in this case, it was um, the low tone. Okay, and you can see how it is wobbling, and a simple intervention. You can see how the gait is so confident. See both of them. Okay. So and then this is another pattern. Okay. So it is here. It is landing on the heel. Okay, with a drop foot, and here it is toe walking or equine skate. Right. Okay. Sorry. Then you have problem with the hip and knee. Okay, so you can see the serious contracture here. We can gradually stretch. So from here to here, there's a host of splints that are involved. And this is a case of CP diplegic. So you have. Uh, hip adduction contractures and uh, knee flexion contracture. So, lens for that. I'm sure all of you must be facing. You can have problems on the toes as well. You have Alex Valgas, Varas, overriding toes, club toes. Okay, so you have this as this thing. I'm sorry, this video is not playing. There's a problem with that. So you have the Alex Valgas splint. I'm sorry, I'm running out of time. Okay, so if you see here, this is my last slide. So this is this is how the child presented, and uh, this is the knee that is plain. So every time, if you see this child, every time the parents want to make the child stand, everything will buckle. So the parents hardly make an attempt to make the child stand when we gave this. So you can see from this to this, the pattern of the limb is completely changed. Okay, and this has happened over a month's time. And once we achieve this, then we go to this splint. Okay, so you can see adduction contracture. We are opening up the abducting the hip. These are all night splints. And once we achieve some relaxation at the adduction, then we start stretching the. So this is this is the ankle. You can see foot, and this is how we try to stretch it. Yeah. So with that, I come to the end of this presentation. This image is from, as mentioned earlier, it is from the headquarters of WHO. Here I am, and I was invited there for the same topic, not the topic, my work that I presented to you. So I was invited there to present that. Yeah, thank you, thank you for your patient hearing. I am done. Thank you, sir. Very informative session. Yes, and now the participants, sir, we will take only a few questions, sir. And already uh, it will be running out of time. Yeah, yeah. And we don't have issue. You are busy with your work. That's why we will take one or uh, three questions only we will take from the participants. Now it's now open to the participants. You can ask uh, your doubts. You can unmute your mic and you can ask your questions. Sir, how's any other how session? Do, any other um, 
thing uh, that reduces spasticity. Any other technique? Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Can Hello, you sir. hear me? Your voice is not clear. Hello, sir. Hello. You can unmute. Unmute and you can ask your question, sir. You are Hello, muted. Sir. and how much time it takes uh, the quadriplegic patient to recover normally hello pangas sir pangas sir you are time it takes uh, a quadriplegic patient to recover yeah recover means uh, it is a very broad statement okay okay unless you have to identify you know the uh, recover means everything to recover it is not like that so we need to identify as supposing there is a wrist flexion contracture okay okay so wrist flexion contracture now how do we define recovery so here in our practice what we do is the patient wants to do something with that hand okay so we need to find out that if we extend how much extension of the wrist is required to achieve that function that much will be considered as recovery in the context of that function so the recovery we break it into many small small components okay. otherwise we will not be able to deal with that okay okay sir okay and, and as you may ask that the time duration the time duration i can't tell you but mm -hmm. what happened because it is uh, it is not actually a very general thing there are many things that uh, are based on that so the type of the patient the severity of the spasticity the severity of contracture along with that spasticity there are many factors yeah. based on that that we tell but normally if we are expecting some outcome in the first 5 days Okay. In the first five days, we'll get some hint. Okay. Okay, sir. So, Thank you. Like that, yeah. Uh, sir, <laughs> hello, you, sir. Myself, Aman Patnaik from CRC Kozi Code. Sir, my question is, how to just uh, start a splint setup in a newly formed department? For that, you should know splinting. Uh, sir, uh, I I am done my master's MOT hand rehab from Netar. Uh, so then you can start. So no, uh, your suggestion. How? Uh, what is your suggestion or your input regarding that? No, you have to you have to submit a proposal. The space requirement, the tools requirement, yes. The budget, yes. You know that for the capital items, for the uh, consumables, yes. Sir. So you have to prepare a budget and you have to submit it to the organization and justify. Okay. Sir. That uh, how important it will be for your organization. Okay, so there is no one word answer to that. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, sir, let us take a question from a chat box. Hello, sir. There is a question: What are the disadvantages and challenges on hand splinting prescription for cerebral palsy children? Disadvantages and challenges. See, I. I am into splinting, so I'll say everything is advantage only. Yes. <laughs> okay. Now, no. Uh, to uh, I mean, to come to your question. Now, yeah. advantage and disadvantage. The whole, uh, you know, the discussion of advantage and disadvantage is based on what are the options available. Okay. Supposing thumb in palm. 
Okay, there is a thumb in palm. What are the uh, what are the options are available to bring the thumb out of the palm in a way that is convenient, comfortable, short method? Okay, so like that we have to wait. Okay, so uh, probably it will be very difficult to give a straight answer that way. Yes, sir. This is always in the context. What are yeah. the options you have? Yes. Sir. So when so, you don't have an option, then and in a circumstance where splint is the only option, yeah. Okay. Then this question of uh, advantage disadvantage doesn't come. Yes. Sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So which sir, uh, there is a uh, one more question, sir, and which yeah. splint can be used for the dystonic uh, hand? Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Good question. The dystonic. Now, as we all know, dystonic or spastic or patients with low tone, the nature of uh, the tone will to an extent decide on what would be our splinting intervention. Okay. So, as you mentioned that uh, in dystonic condition, in dystonic condition, we try to stabilize the limb at the proximal joints. Okay, so if we are giving a splint, we, if we are wanting to improve the hand function, we probably will have to try out, you know, we probably have to try out if we can stabilize the elbow joint in a particular angle and see how the hand behaves. Okay, we probably will have to stabilize the wrist joint and see how the fingers behave. We will not directly splint the uh, fingers. Okay, so proximal stabilization could be a better option, but it is not a thumbs rule. This is how we try out. Sir, Deepak here. Yeah, hi, yeah. Yeah, sir. Sir, I have a question regarding the use of the splint. Uh, how can we decide this splint, uh, like uh, which one is splint we can use in night or which, which one is splint we can use in a daytime? Okay. Is there any specific criteria through which we can decide it? No, there, there is a, there is no strict criteria, but what we do is splint that are corrective in nature. They go as night splints because we, we are expecting that the child to move around. So during the daytime, we will be more into functional splints, splints okay. that will, you know, that will increase the person's functional output or daytime we might use therapeutic splints okay okay right but pure corrective splints will go as night splints right okay sir thank you yeah. sir so thank you sir uh, now uh, we are already short of time and uh, now it's the time to deliver the vote of thanks and uh, thanks a lot sir thanks for your thanks for sparing your valuable time with us and indeed it was a wonderful webinar it went well with the active participation of all the participants and they have come up with uh, so many questions and all and uh, it was uh, in summary it was a wonderful question. one of the best webinars that we have conducted so far by crc dawan gray we we'll, uh, we had a very good attendance here also and uh, even though you were busy schedule you spent your time with us sir we are very really grateful to you and for sharing your experience it was more practical than the theoretical uh, whatever the session you had with uh, lots of videos and pictures it was more practical that's what uh, needed for the uh, professionals to uh, practice this sprinting in their practice and uh, thank you sir on behalf of crc davanagare our director dr uma sangar mohandi sir and uh, our patron cpv ramkumar sir the director of uh, nikit sangra bal and uh, so we hope uh, we need we need your uh, mean support and we hope to have such a webinar in future also sir and collaborative webinar in future also and uh, once again thanks for your time sir and if you have any word to say you can uh, share with us sir now. yeah I, i just wanted to convey thanks uh, for the wonderful participation a big number you all turned up in big number okay and uh, i hope uh you know we you know my my wish is to me and to all of you is that how to make the lives of the cerebral palsy children not only cerebral palsy children with motor concerns 
you know so i mean that is my area of interest so how we can uh, you know add to or contribute into the lives of these children with motor problem so that because their entire life is ahead of them you know so how we can make them functional so by the time they come to the active social life they are better equipped you know so that is my this thing so through this presentation that is the message that i wanted to uh, give and uh, i i'd be more than happy if anybody working in any part of the country you know at any point of time any discussions over the patient we do it all the time you know any opinion on your patients that you are seeing okay that uh, that can be offered and thanks uh, dr mohanty for this wonderful opportunity and your entire team thank you thanks sir thanks thank you thank you sir for coming and uh, joining with us thank you sir thank okay. you okay thank you sir thank you yeah so thank you thank you all the participants for being here with us and for spending your time with us and i hope uh, this uh, program was uh, very informative and fruitful and uh, for your practice and hope to have such uh, wonderful webinars in forthcoming months and years and uh, need your support for that and uh, one more request to the participants we have shared the feedback link form in the chat box i request all you to uh, fill and submit and share and so that you will receive a e certificate immediately through your email so thank you once again so this link will be open for another 5 minutes uh, by the time you can submit your form so after 5 minutes it will be closed thank you thank you one and all thanks for your time mm -hmm.